Dr. Hoffman is obviously a <clears throat> very erudite gentleman who gets to talk about truth and beauty. I get to talk about wallowing in the mud with pigs. Um, I, I'm a simple country doctor, but uh, we're going to talk about some fairly practical things in this hour, and that has to do with clearing for psych. Now, if there's anything you like more than a back pain, it's the nurse who says there's a crazy out there. Right? Don't you love it? In America, probably 20% of adults will, at some point in time, have a psychiatric diagnosis of some kind. Our problem is if we diagnose your appendix, we know what to do about your appendix, right? Now you've got a Galeazzi's fracture. We know what to do with a Galeazzi's. Not that it's not bad, but we know what to do. And they come in and say, what's the matter? I'm hopelessly depressed. You're hopelessly depressed at this moment in time because you don't know what to do. I've got three rules for you. Follow these three rules, you'll be fine. First one is all families are dysfunctional. Does anybody disagree with that? All emergency docs should understand all families are dysfunctional and they're gonna bring somebody in to you. It's never a good story. Number two, all crazy people die of something organic. Nobody ever put down schizophrenia as the cause of death. So you're allowed to have both a psychiatric condition and an organic condition. In fact, the two frequently run together. And as, as Jerry was talking about the red flags, 25 chief complaints make up 94% of the visits in emergency medicine. And with those 25 chief complaints, that's how we ought to train residents to say, here, it's this, this is the chief complaint. These are the red flags you have to worry about. After that, I don't know, do what you want. Last one is you may be the last, you may be the last real doctor to ever see a psych patient. Did you ever think about that? Because what happens when they get sent to psych? Somebody shrinks them. I promise you that. I've got a case where a woman, she, sometimes patients are their own worst enemies, right? This is a gal who's drunk, full of pills, is a schizophrenic by diagnosis, is involved in a, she's a motorcycle chick in her spare time, uh, you know, leather chaps and all that sort of stuff comes into the department having been in an auto versus her motorcycle crash. She's bitching, complaining, and this, that, and people, see, people say, well, I don't know, her stuff's wearing off. She's been on psych before, let's send her to psych. Because it must be her schizophrenia acting up. Well, the first note upstairs from the, from the psych nurse is, patient, patient trying to manipulate staff by refusing to urinate. That's what it says on the chart. Patient manipulating staff by refusing to urinate, refuses to walk to group therapy. <laughs> Holy Jesus. So somebody on rounds in the morning, you know, the third year medical student who just gotten off of being on emergency medicine, said, uh, anybody ever look at her C-spine films? They, they find them. They're perfect down to C5. And he says they're good down to C5. And the psychiatrist, this is uncontested in court, said, how many are there? <laughs> and he said, no, there are actually seven of them. We probably ought to see down a little farther. And of course, she had a dislocation at that level. Um, just understand, you can have both, and it, it can be a problem. It can be a real problem. <clears throat> so you may be the last real doctor to see anybody. 
because we only look for those diseases that we understand in our specialty, right? George Bernard Shaw said, if you go to a general surgeon, he'll cut your leg off, i.e., we look for the disease. I don't know what George Bernard Shaw would have said about urologists, but uh, it's, it, it's a problem. <clears throat> All right. So let's talk about the effect on patients' workups who have a concomitant site diagnosis. This has been looked at. It's looked at several different ways. Article one here looks at 300 physicians who they questioned, they gave them a scenario about the patient. But then they changed it and some people got a scenario that also included a psych diagnosis. And then they say, what are you gonna do with so-and-so? There was a 30% difference and how aggressive they were going to be to work things up, as if you couldn't have both diseases. Now, you and I think that that would never happen to us, but it does happen to us. When you pick up a chart and it says a disease entity on it, you are prejudiced to some degree about the patient. If you have to teach residents one thing, it's to take a deep breath, and think about their own controlling mechanisms. You and I all have hot buttons in us. There are things which you can say to us which stop rational thinking. We, it really happens. And so just like it did with these 300 physicians, it'll happen to you as well. <clears throat> what about medically cleared? How about patients with psychiatric presentations as they go to the ER? Are they going to actually get admitted less, admitted more? They get admitted less. Their disease are taken less seriously. If they come in with a broken leg, they get less medication for pain. There are all kinds of ways we treat these people differently, and I think that that's right. Then they looked at those people who did get admitted, and they asked, what about the health care they actually got separate from their psych care? Well. Half of the people who were admitted with a psych diagnosis didn't have complete vital signs taken. Half of them didn't have a temperature. Half of them didn't have a pulse rate. Why? Because they were going to psych. Never never land. Fairyland. Nobody gave a shit what they did. And by the way, these were Canadians. They're supposed to be better than us. No, they're not. No. All right. If you actually look at psych patients, there's also a gap in their life expectancy. They will die. <clears throat> paper, paper three looked at people with psychiatric illness. Uh, <laughs> and by the way, this appeared in Jerry's favorite journal because they publish him. Uh, the, uh, the BMJ, British Medical Journal, and basically it said this, that if you look at those patients, uh, their life expectancy is some 13 years less overall. Because they're going to die from something. Now, it may be just because they tend, some of them tend to live on the street, some of them get in bar fights, some of them do all these other things, but in general, <clears throat> They're not going to live as long, and you're going to have a problem. By the, by the way, we're not the only country in the world that has a problem with uh, psych patients and psychiatric disease, which runs over, as you're all aware, into alcohol and drug abuse, correct? The Germans have, have basically thrown up their hands on this issue. If you go through drug and alcohol therapy three times, that's it. What their data says, the chances that you're actually going to get better are so small, we're not going to put you through it again. It isn't endless in, in, in the Germans. And, and they pretty much have decided they're going to kind of withhold things. <laughs> so what do they do? <coughs> the Germans try and concentrate on any medical problems they have, but they basically said, here's a bunch of psychiatric social conditions which we cannot fix. And they don't feel that bad about it. By the way, 
if you ever had to have a bad psych diagnosis. I think in general, in emergency departments, avoid psychiatric diagnoses whenever you can. Here's the one you don't want. Article four, four catatonic disorder. I'm now catatonic. People were called catatonic, and what was the worst thing they could have? A diagnosis of a psychiatric disease before they came in, because what would they decide they had? Catatonia. Well, because you're not moving, doesn't mean you're catatonic, that you've gone into some sort of psychiatric state. In fact, and this was done by the Mayo Clinic. We're not worthy. It's the Mayo Clinic. This is their own places. 20% of those people who, who they look back over the records who had a diagnosis of catatonia, 20% had a major medical problem. It wasn't their psychiatric disorder. And uh, here's a couple of examples. Uh, they tended to be more in, in uh, females than males. <coughs> Excuse me. They missed a case of encephalitis, uh, encephalopathic from hypokalemia, hyponatremia, hypoglycemia, underlying causes of major medical illness written off as catatonic because they had an underlying psych diagnosis. What I'm basically saying is this, just forget they have the psych diagnosis and look at the medical problem. The disparities here were, were pretty amazing, and this is at a major center. Question two, what is being done for medical clearance around the country? Here's what's not being done. <clears throat> History and physical examination and their vital signs, because this is gonna be important in just a minute to decide who goes to medicine and who goes to psych. Now, Here's what happens in reality. You call up the medicine resident and say, you know, I've got this guy who says he's crazy, isn't he? I say, well, maybe there's another. They say, call psych. Then you call psych. You talk to the psych resident who says, well, I've got this. He says, he's full of drugs and alcohol, right? Well, maybe there's some of that. He said, call medicine. We need a service that does both crazy and drunk and full of drugs. That's called the emergency department, okay? <laughs> you are the arbiter of what's going to happen to these people. So what do you need to do, history and physical, as I've spoken about, look at the vital signs. There is no reason why schizophrenia, bipolar disease, Man, a manic depression, whatever it is, should give you tachycardia, should give you hyperthermia. None of those are related. Let's have a rule in this room today going home. Abnormal vital signs go where? Medicine. Thank you. Because maybe they've taken another drug. They wouldn't do that though, would they? They wouldn't take a drug. They wouldn't do any of that kind of stuff. Just to understand that's what you need to do. How much workup? There are two answers to that question. One is a medical answer. The other one is a political question. I cannot get a patient into the psych unit who has not had a blood alcohol and a drug screen. Can any of you, you realize we learn almost nothing. If you go through all these papers, if the patient's admitted to taking drugs, the change in their management is almost zero. We don't do anything different but they won't let, it, let them in without it. So I've just given up on this issue. I just go ahead and I'll do that for them, not a problem. The average 23-year-old who comes in, who is, is in their depressive phase, I mean, you could work them up to hell, wouldn't have it. But taking those people with otherwise normal examination and vital signs, doing extensive lab testing is not worth it. It is not worth it. And I think that um, <clears throat> Article 8 here, uh, 6, 7, and 8 are pretty good together. And what they talk about is exactly that fact. General examination, 
neuroexamination, and the doing of testing. 40 years old, 50 years old, probably useless. Now, this varies dramatically by age. You all know that the term, the old name for schizophrenia was dementia precox, which means pre-cooked craziness. Nobody becomes a schizophrenic at age uh, 70. It didn't, never happened. You were nuts when you were a kid. You were even crazier when you were a teenager. These people don't come from nowhere. Rule. If they got funky at age 60 or 70, it's organic and not psychiatric. Nobody goes that length of time and then becomes a crazy. It doesn't work out. So, as suggested in Article 8, and I think these are reasonable suggestions, that if they're above 60 and you're thinking about sending them to the psych unit, their feeling was they, this is the group of patients who do deserve the reasonable metabolic cardiac workup getting in, and they did find things. <clears throat> what do we mean by that? Well, in their study, oh, oh, and what, what else do you always do on any potentially reproducible age female? Pregnancy test. Do they lie a lot? No. Yes. No, nobody lies. <clears throat> but you're going to have that. But it was interesting in, this, in their study, over the age of 60, when they worked these people up, if you hadn't done that, you would have missed 16%. 16% of people had unanticipated medical illness. We're not talking 25-year-olds or 30-year-olds. Why is a 60-year-old coming into your psych unit? Why would that be new? Why would that be different? We have no idea. Keep that one in mind. Question three. Uh, which problems, what problems do need to be identified? And I, and I think that, that obviously the drug withdrawal questions, all of those things are obvious. Uh, but as we age, I'm only thinking about the last woman I had waiting there that the PA told me, she's going to go to psych probably in her mid-60s. Uh, it's Michigan where I live. It's cold in the winter. Uh, and she, you know, I just kind of looked at this gal and I said, that isn't right. And of course, all we did was a TSH as part of the, part of the process. She was so damn hype, uh, you know, hypo that it was unbelievable. We treated her in the emergency department in four hours. She's actually looking normal. She's actually talking normally. Think about some of those kinds of patients who just don't fit the pattern. <clears throat> so um, I'm not going to answer, and I can't answer the question of what you will do in your hospital. But again, it is age-based, previous diagnosis-based, and certain things that you need to believe in. It's, it's just like Nobody should ever make the diagnosis in this room of new onset migraine headache in somebody over the age of 50. It never happened in the history of the world. The last one of those I saw, who they say, well, I think they're a little nuts and, and uh, they, they're presenting with this migraine and a few things like that. No, they had a temporal arteritis which would knock your eyeballs out. I can't tell you the number of our young who don't actually touch patients anymore. They don't actually palpate the head to figure out where it hurts. You need to do that. <clears throat> uh, so, <clears throat> let's see here. Uh, I'm gonna make a couple more points before we get done. Next, special problems with suspected psych disorders. Another word you do not want to see on an ER chart is conversion disorder, conversion hysteria. I'd be very careful writing that down. Now, you and I all have certain patients that we know what's going on. What's the matter? I can't elevate my arm. 
I can't lift my arm. How long has it been going on? A week. Well, how, how high did you used to be able to? I could do it like this before. Okay. There are some conversion hysterias. <clears throat> but be careful that that's your first thing. I always remember a patient who came in. He would have conversion coma all the time. And, the, you know, we kind of expected him on a regular basis. And they'd say, John's coming. You know what? You've got to go through the process on that person like you do everybody else. I think conversion is a very difficult thing. The, one of the young ladies I saw at Dartmouth, <clears throat> of course, they call somebody from the psych service or the neurology service down to see this 17-year-old girl who just had a baby, who's been home crying, and now she says her legs are weak and this, that, and other thing. They say, you got to check her before she goes to uh, psych. So I go down to see her, <clears throat> do my exam. Maybe your reflexes are a little down everywhere. I said, okay, they can't take you into the psych service. You know, it's, it's the middle of winter, it's cold. There's nobody in the house on the psych service. I said, we'll just keep you here for the next four hours and then we'll get, get the psych guy to see you. In four hours later, she couldn't move her legs. She had the most rapidly rising case of Guillain-Barre I had ever seen in my life. She was saved because they asked Neuro to see her and not psych at that moment in time. We all, we're all going to have a case like that, and there's nothing you can do about it. <clears throat> Article 8 here talks about suspected conversion disorders and uh, uh, the avoidance of errors. And this is, a, this is a Harvard paper. You know, big time. Harvard, the Mass General. <clears throat> Again, we're not worthy. And they talk about patients, <clears throat> excuse me, who had severe organic disease, who they had decided were had been written up as conversion disorders and then went badly under their care. So I would think about this. This is, this is something real, something to, uh, something to remember. Um, what are some other pearls here? When you're dealing with, with patients in the emergency department, we've combined a few things in this chapter. One of them has to do with ETOH and getting them to metabolize their alcohol. What do they always do on TV when they've got somebody who's drunk, they give them what? Has anybody ever done a study on that? Yes, they have. It doesn't work. By the way, we start IVs on people all the time in the department. Did IV fluids help these people any more than oral hydration? No, they didn't. Now, they did comment in one of the papers that it was sort of a bed anchor, right? They were less likely to walk out the door. But if you don't like that, you know, handcuff them to something, I guess, if you want. But it didn't do any good. Water through the mouth is as good as there is for moving the situation along. By the way, is there any relationship between the blood alcohol numbers reported and behavior of the patient? No, there are plenty of people who at 0.08 are, um, they're falling down drunk. There are people who are at 0.08 are going into alcohol withdrawal. It, it, it's across the board. The only reason we have an alcohol number is for prosecution of cases of drunk driving, boating, flying the plane, all that sort of thing. We do have them. But we should not imagine that there's any linear relationship between that number. Because individuals, they, they, they get their alcohol dehydrogenase going. I mean, we actually at my place had Olympic level drinkers. I mean, if there's ever a contest between us and the Soviets, uh, I, I don't know what we call them anymore. We used to call them the Russians for a while, and whatever Putin would like to be called these days. But if his drinking team and our drinking team get together, I've got the team. Like, okay, I've got the guys for this. It makes no difference. An interesting cause, and one I've only had to treat a few times, was the reversal, the rapid reversal of a corticosteroid-induced mania. 
Steroids have a downside. Um, <clears throat> the last person I had to do this to, because um, I, I haven't practiced in a few years now, the last person I had to do this to had been put on, been to multiple places because of his recurrent migraines and had been put on steroids at one place, relatively high dose rapid taper. He came in absolutely manic, crazy. Uh, paper number 20 is worth, is worth noting. This is the use of valproate to, reduce, to reverse that. I've only done it, as I say, a couple of times, and it works. Uh, this is one of those things that it's not all the time, but when you notice that they've gone from being a reasonable person to being manic, and part of the drugs the family brings in are multiple dose packs of Medrol or whatever they've been decided to use, try it. Probably worthwhile. Uh, let's see if there's anything else before we're done. Uh, there's, uh, there is a paper here on, on looking at uh, uh, various malignant syndromes, things like that, um, serotonin type situations. How are you going to diagnose those people? They will never be in there with normal vital signs. I've never seen it. Never seen it happen. That's why in the site complaint, the new patient, if they don't have full vital signs, there's something wrong with your system. You're not picking up these cases. All right, any questions?